about Tolkien's wizardry, uh, how his Christian view, Christian metaphysics actually molded Middle Earth, and how that, that Middle Earth has shaped the postmodern world. That's uh, really changed the world that we live in. So here's a little overview of what I'm gonna talk about. I've got five theses about Christian philosophy and Tolkien. And uh, then we'll get into talking about what Tolkien's philosophy was. The relationship between Tolkien and the other scholars there at Oxford in England uh, called the Inklings. I'm gonna focus specifically on one of the other Inklings. He's maybe not as well known as some of the others, a man named Owen Barfield. So I'll tell you a little bit about him and how he influenced Tolkien. And then finally talk about what I call, what I call the uncanny influence of Tolkien's work. Now Tolkien has had more influence on our world than we might expect. So here are the five theses. Um, first one is, uh, first two actually, they're sort of boring theses. They're true of most, many, at least many authors. Uh, first, that Tolkien had theological views that influenced his works. I think there's no question about that. We'll see more details of that. Uh, secondly, Tolkien saw his, picture, pick, his fiction in part as a vehicle for propagating those views, as a way of spreading those ideas. Again, that's not terribly unusual. In fact, it's fairly common. Um, thirdly, this is where it gets a little more interesting. Tolkien's fiction, his mythology, was actually the embodiment or incarnation of that philosophy. And this is quite unique, I think, or not entirely unique, but it's, it's, it's unusual. Um, you certainly see this in Plato, uh, but also in someone like Dante. Dante's a divine comedy, Milton's Paradise Lost, maybe some of the poetry of, of Blake, where it's, the, the philosophy isn't just communicated in, in, the, in the work, it's rather uh, the work becomes the philosophy, embodies the philosophy in some profound way. Uh, fourthly, and I think this is unique for Tolkien, is that the very philosophy that Tolkien is communicating and that is embodied in his philosophy is the very thing that also guided Tolkien in building his work and constructing the work the way he did. So the philosophy that's communicated, the philosophy that's embodied is also the philosophy that guides the construction and guides the embodiment itself. And finally, I'm gonna argue that to explain Tolkien's work, to, to explain Tolkien's success as an author, we have to look to the philosophical and theological substance of his work. But this is not just some extra add-on, but it's really essential to understanding Tolkien and to appreciating Tolkien for who he was. Okay, so first question is what was Tolkien's philosophy? It's what I would call a Christianized Aristotelian Neoplatonism. So it's a lot, that's a lot of terms, but it, it really refers to what's sometimes called the, the perennial philosophy of late antiquity in the Middle Ages that is incorporated into Christian theology, in the, at least in the Western world to a large extent. Now this of course starts with the two great philosophers of the ancient world, Plato and Aristotle, but it's also communicated through some key figures in, in the uh, ancient world. Plotinus, who is uh, usually classified as the Neoplatonist, lives in the third century AD, and he has a profound influence on Christian thinkers there in Alexandria, which is the main uh, intellectual center of the late ancient world. Uh, this gets communicated later to Augustine, one of the great church fathers in North Africa, who is first, first becomes a Neoplatonist before he becomes a Christian, actually. Then uh, we should mention Boethius, very important Roman philosopher of the uh, sixth century, who translates much of ancient philosophy into Latin, thereby influences the, the, the medieval world, the modern world. There's a figure named Pseudo Dionysius, a, a Neoplatonist philosopher of the sixth or seventh century, uh, who's a Christian and who uh, builds heavily on Plotinus, actually, and has a great influence on both the East and the West, both Eastern and Western churches. I look to him. He uses the name Dionysius from a, a figure in, in the book of Acts, who's one of Paul's converts in Athens. Uh, and then finally, Thomas Aquinas, the uh, the doctor, doctor of the church in the uh, Middle Ages, 13th century, who draws on all of this uh, to develop uh, in what we call now the perennial philosophy, or sometimes it's called Thomism. Uh, this is the kind of philosophy that, uh, that, uh, that Tolkien is drawing on. Let me just talk about a few of the main themes of that philosophy. And the first one is the idea of um, the, what we call the privation theory of evil. That is that um, evil, is a form of non-being or non-existence, while goodness consists in the fullness of being, the fullness of existing. And this means that absolute goodness is possible. That's in fact what God is. God is absolute, complete, perfect goodness. 
But absolute evil is impossible. To be absolutely evil thing would have to not exist at all. It'd have to be completely devoid of being, and that's impossible. So evil is always parasitic on good for all of its energy and its, and its efficacy. An evil person can exist only by, by being partly good. So evil is always a corruption or a twisting of the goodness. This is an idea that actually starts with Plotinus, this uh, Greek philosopher, but very much is incorporated into Christian theology through Augustine and Boethius. And we see this in the, in the Lord of the Rings. First of all, let's see in, in the character of the ring wraiths. These uh, are ruined, twisted human beings. And um, the word wraith is sort of interesting here. Uh, the English word wraith is, is related etymologically to words like wrath, anger, writhe in pain, uh, rhythm or twisted as in a wreath in, 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 in modern English. So the ring wraiths are twisted, distorted versions of human beings. They're actually not only invisible, but also blind. Uh, they rely on their horses for their senses. They lack any kind of independent thought or will. And similarly, Sauron, although he's very powerful, is blind in many ways, intellectually blind. He's blind to the fellowship's true purpose. And that brings about his downfall. He's not, he lacks the wisdom to recognize that the fellowship might try to destroy the ring instead of simply use it. Another key Platonic theme is that evil is associated with disharmony and goodness with harmony. And you see this throughout the Lord of the Rings. Um, the good are united for the most part in a fellowship, a friendship, a harmony of purpose. In contrast, the wicked are constantly divided into factions. They're working at cross purposes, right? Sauron and Saruman are supposedly allied, but in fact, they're locked in mutually destructive competition. The orcs hate their own masters and they're ruled only by fear and that results in lots of inefficiencies. Uh, evil is always parasitic on the good. As Frodo said to Sam, the shadow, at least Morgoth, can only mock, it cannot make, it cannot make real things of its own. The one ring which uh, provides its bearers with invisibility reminds us of the ring of Gyges, which Plato's characters discuss in the Republic. Remember the ring gave Bilbo and Frodo and others the power to escape from the bonds of the social contract. They could do whatever they want without, without and, and enrich themselves without suffering any kind of consequences. Yet, just as in, in Plato's vision of the just man, the hobbits are moved by love of justice for itself, and Frodo's willing to sacrifice all worldly goods for the greater good. Now, another uh, crucial Platonic theme that we find repeated in Tolkien's work is that of the imitation of and participation in models or paradigms. There's this old idea, this idea in Plato of the, of the theory of the forms that corresponding to all of the things we see in our world, the visible and tangible things, there are invisible and intangible forms that are the paradigms of which the things that we see are merely copies. Like the individual cats we see are copies of the, the form of the cat. The various things like the constitution or the Nuremberg trials are all copies or imitations of the form of justice and so on. And this idea is we find throughout really Tolkien's work. Um, the, um, the file of Gladriel, for instance, remember that, that uh, Gladriel uses, that contains a reflection of the star of Arendelle. And that star in Arendelle is one of the Silmarils, which in turn is a reflection or emanation of the light of the two trees of Valinor, which I depicted here. Uh, and uh, the, the two trees, uh, similarly, the, the, the sacred tree of, of, of Gondor is a copy or a, a child of the sacred tree of Tal Arasia in the Undying Line, which also is copied from the two trees. In the Silmarillion, in fact, we're told that all of Ea, that is all of the physical universe, which includes the Middle Earth, is the incarnation of a pre-existing model in the form of music, the so-called music of the Ainur, which are these angelic intelligences that are singing in the early part of the Silmarillion, and they are themselves copies or imitations of the one of God, the Eru. Um, finally, Christians, um, Platonists believe, uh, there we go, there's the star of Arendelle and the, the tree of Gondor. Um, finally, uh, Christian Platonists believe that the world is governed by a pervasive divine providence that shapes our ends, as Hamlet puts it, Shakespeare's Hamlet puts it. Now, there are many examples of such providence in Tolkien's fiction. You may remember Gandalf's conversation with Frodo, quote, uh, behind that, behind the discovery of the ring, there was something else at work, 
beyond any design of the ring maker, that is Sauron. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its, its maker, in which case you, Frodo, were also meant to have it. And that may be an encouraging thought. So there's a providence that meant Frodo to get the ring and, and Gandalf's encouraged by that. Secondly, you might remember Elrond at the, at the council in Rivendell. Elrond says this, he said, you here were called, I say, though I have not called you to me, strangers from a distant land. You have come and are met here in the very nick of time, by chance as it may seem, yet it is not so, it is not by chance. Believe rather that it is so ordered that we who sit here and none others must now find counsel for the peril of the world. So providence has brought the members together at there at the council. And providence uses acts of mercy and goodness to produce what Tolkien calls a you catastrophe, the good catastrophe, the surprising good, good happy ending. The best example of this is the, is the cooperation between divine providence and human goodness and mercy that in the mercy that's shown repeatedly to Gollum, that miserable creature. And then the indispensable role that Gollum himself plays at the end of the story. Gollum's life, as you may remember, is spared first by Bilbo, then by Faramir, by Frodo, and finally by Sam. The wood elves also release him from his imprisonment out of compassion for him. And on Mount Doom, as Sam is about to kill Gollum, who has just betrayed and attacked Frodo, Sam thinks this. He says, it would have been just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature. But deep in his heart, Sam, in Sam's heart, there was something that restrained him. He could not strike this thing lying in the dust, forlorn, ruinous, and utterly wretched. So Sam himself had borne the ring for a short period. And as it says in the text, quote, dimly he guessed the agony of Gollum's shriveled mind and body and slave to the ring. So Sam lets him go out of mercy, out of compassion. And that, of course, makes possible the ultimate destruction of the ring. Conversely, evil always works in vain. Evil, as, as it, the text says, works in vain, preparing always only the soil for unexpected good to sprout in. There's many examples of this. Remember, Boromir tries to take the ring from Frodo by force, and he thereby shatters the fellowship. But that allows Fran Frodo and Sam to undertake their mission without too large an entourage. And it sends the rest to the west to the aid of Rowan and Gondor. Gollum's attempt to betray Sam and Frodo into the hands of the murderous spider, uh, Shelob, enables them to pass through the otherwise impassable fortress of Kirith Ungol. And Sauron's southern allies unwittingly provide the very ships that um, Aragorn and the others use uh, to, to bring the needed aid to the city of Gondor. And finally, the massive mustering of Sauron's army for an attack on the armies of the west provides Frodo and Sam the opportunity of passing unnoticed through the emptied crossroads of Mordor. And, 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 and Gollum's, of course, unconquerable lust for the ring leads him to bite off Frodo's ring finger, and that leads ultimately to the destruction of the ring. So this um, commitment, um, this commitment to, to a Christianized Neoplatonism was common to Tolkien's inner circle of friends in Oxford, the group that they called themselves the Inklings. They were all writers, of course. Uh, the most famous of these inklings was C.S. Lewis, the uh, scholar of English literature, philosopher, apologist for Christianity, author of science fiction and children's fantasy literature. There's also Charles Williams, the charismatic uh, poet and novelist. Uh, Austin Farrer, a very important theologian. Um, ben, Dom B. Griffiths, um, also called Swami Dayananda, uh, a Benedictine monk and, and philosopher. Uh, Dorothy L. Sayers, the playwright and mystery novelist. And then last but not least, Owen Barfield, a unique and somewhat eccentric philosopher and linguist. Now these inklings were united in a common quest, a quest which was involved nothing short than the destruction, the destruction of the scientific materialism that had dominated educated thinking in the mid 20th century. Now at that time, in the 1940s, 30s and 40s and 50s, this must have seemed a mad quest, an adventure. But in retrospect, it's quite remarkable how successful they were, especially Tolkien and Lewis, who are among the most widely read and most influential authors of serious fiction and of philosophical argumentation. 
Now, Tolkien himself saw his fiction as an essential part of this enterprise, as a vehicle for the propagation of Christianity and of the kind of Neoplatonism that I've described. Now, we must be careful not to misunderstand what this means in Tolkien's case. It, there's not any sense in which Tolkien prostituted his talent for the sake of propaganda. He didn't treat his art merely as a means rather than an end in itself. He doesn't pervert or twist the story or the characters in order to serve some non-artistic purpose. Gandalf never interrupts the story in order to give us a lecture on the philosophy of Neoplatonism. In contrast to say to someone like Ayn Rand, who's, who did exactly this in her novels uh, in order to make them a vehicle for the propagation of her objectivism. So in what sense then was Tolkien's fiction a vehicle for his philosophy? To understand this, we must grasp my third thesis, the thesis that Tolkien's fiction was an embodiment of his philosophy. That is, Tolkien used a kind of alchemy to transmute his philosophy into story. In this way, the two are inseparable, even in principle. That's why Tolkien's fiction can be a vehicle for propagating his philosophy without doing so, without twisting the art to an extrinsic end. Tolkien's story as story and his story as embodiment of philosophy are one and the same thing. Now, no one has done this more effectively than Tolkien, than and perhaps Plato himself. Both Plato and Tolkien understood the unique power of myth as a vehicle of, of philosophy. I like to think of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien in, a, in certain respects as pr constituting a kind of team, where, um, which is a, creates the equivalent of Plato's dialogues. Lewis provided the argumentation, the logic, and Tolkien supplies the myth. And together they're more effective than either would have been individually. Now 20th century philosophy by and large has exaggerated the importance of logic. And I say this as a logician myself, I'm trained as a logician. But I think at this point Heidegger was right. It's through the poet that we can best encounter reality. The usefulness of logic depends on the fact that we have some independent access to truth, to true premises for our arguments. Without true premises, logic is condemned to the law of gaigo, as we say in English, garbage in, garbage out. You have false premises, you know, all the logic in the world won't get you to the truth. How then do we discover the truth? How do we get the reliable intuitions of truth that philosophy so often takes for granted? Well, that's through, through poetry. Now, there's a famous debate that uh, Lewis and Tolkien had in the, in the 1920s. This is before Lewis himself was a Christian, when he was still an atheist. At that point, Lewis loved the myths and the stories, but he thought that they were lies and therefore worthless, even though, as he said, breathe through silver. And in, a in a famous conversation or debate that they had in the woods just outside of Bodlin College in 1928, I think it is, uh, Tolkien convinced Lewis that he was wrong, that myths are not lies, that they are in fact the best way of conveying certain truths that are otherwise inexpressible. The myths create a kind of uh, reflection of the light that God uh, uses to express himself through the minds of the poets. So this takes us to my fourth thesis, that Tolkien had a philosophical theory that guided him in his translation of philosophy into myth. And this is where we turn back to Barfield, Owen Barfield, his theory of ancient semantic unities. Um, now in, in a conversation with, Tol with uh, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien once said that this book by Owen Barfield called Poetic Diction changed my entire viewpoint, my whole outlook. So I think it's really crucial to, to understand this in order to understand how, how Tolkien wrote what he did. What, what were these ancient semantic unities that, uh, that uh, Barfield is talking about? Well, Barfield uses the example of the word spirit. Now in, in Greek, in Latin, in Hebrew, actually in English, and in many other languages, the same word is used to express the wind, the breath, breathing air in and out, the immaterial component or soul of the human being, and also any kind of supernatural entity like an angel or a, or a ghost. Now Barfield says that uh, there are two theories about how this works. One theory he called the naturalistic theory. And on that theory, in the very, very primitive languages, there was just a word for wind or breath. And then this word becomes extended or used in a metaphorical way to refer to the soul or to the angels. But Barfield thinks that this is wrong. He thinks that the evidence points in the opposite direction. 
that as we look further and further back in language, in the history of language, we find that words, we don't find a primitive level where the words just have one meaning. They always seem to have more and more meanings the further back we go. So Garfield argues that, um, that we're looking at this entirely the wrong way. We're looking at this from a point of view of, of a modern perspective. He argues that, uh, that, that, that we're, our error is what he, what he calls logomorphism. That is, we're, we're reading back into the ancient mind distinctions that are the product of modern thought. So for the ancient mind, wind, breath, the soul, spirits, were not different things. They were a single thing that experienced in somewhat different ways. And Barfield proposes that the ancient world was actually right in thinking this. Our modern scientific way of looking, about th looking at things it causes us to be, more, to be narrower in our thinking and to specialize our meanings, to make distinctions that weren't there before. And this process of making these distinctions uh, comes at a cost. It obscures the real ontological unities between mind and body, cause and meaning, particular and universal, and so on. The scientific discourse divides, treating these things as mere metaphors. And so for Barfield, what we need is poetry in order to recapture these ancient unities. Now, Barfield distinguishes between um, what he calls myth and allegory. And this is, a, this is a very important distinction for Tolkien as well. It also corresponds to a distinction between two kinds of figures of speech, which we could call true metaphors and false metaphors. In a true metaphor, the figure of speech does not, does not say two separate things. One literally false and the other one sort of figuratively true. Instead, a true metaphor brings us back to, to, brings back to the surface an ancient meaning that was present in the words from the very beginning. A true metaphor enables us to recapture one of these ancient semantic unities. A pseudo metaphor, in, in, in contrast, expresses information about one thing under the guise of speaking about another. The example I like to use is really bad pseudo metaphors from P.G. Woodhouse. One of the characters, um, I think her name is uh, Madeline Glossop, talks about how the stars are God's daisy chain. Right? Daisy chain is where you, you, you knit a bunch of daisy flowers together to make a little crown. Um, and so, uh, of course, the stars aren't anything like a daisy chain, really. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a sort of clever way of putting together some words. But, um, but true metaphors that Barfield talks about don't do that. They actually reveal something to us that's important. And this distinction is reflected also at the level of story. And here we get the distinction, as I said, between myth and allegory. A myth is a story that conveys truth to us through the imagination. A myth heightens our awareness of the real world by reawakening within us this more primitive, unsophisticated mode of thinking. Barfield said that myths are constituted by a unity of things or a unity of what he calls percepts, that is of, of seeing things a certain way. Whereas an allegory is simply a synthesis of ideas, of concepts. It just puts together artificially different things in such a way that you can't understand the story, the allegory, without understanding what it really means. You need the secret decoder ring to figure out what's going on. However, in a, in a myth, you don't need any such decoder ring. You can just enjoy the story in and of itself. Tolkien talks about this under the terminology of sub-creation. That is, he creates an entire world, the world of Middle Earth. And in that world, there are truths. That is, real spiritual and moral truths. The very same spiritual and moral structure exists in Middle Earth as exists in our world. And so by learning more about Middle Earth, we actually learn more about the real world. We become more attuned to these, these fundamental um, realities. Let me give you another example that, um, actually, it's, well, yeah, I should mention this. So, so uh, Barfield thinks that there are two ways of thinking about the world. The prosaic world, the world we express in prose, the world of science, which is very pragmatic, utilitarian, tries to gain control over things, makes a sharp distinction between me and the world, subject and object. It always makes distinctions, differentiates, uh, tries to achieve clarity, gets rid of ambiguity, and uh, analyzes things into parts. And then when it unifies, it unifies things only through its own artificial concepts. It doesn't discover unity, it doesn't uncover reality. The poetic mind is, is, is contemplative rather than pragmatic. It's not trying to do anything, it's just trying to understand. 
He doesn't try to control, it just tries to participate with nature and the world around us. There's no separation of subject and object of me and you or me and it. It perceives real unities in the world. It doesn't always distinguish and differentiate. It grasps wholes rather than just parts. And it perceives unities through acts of the imagination. Now, another great example of this ancient semantic unity is the word light. So Barfield argues that, that light expresses a single reality that's both physical and intellectual and spiritual. And so when we talk about spiritual enlightenment, according to Barfield, that's a true metaphor. There's something really in common there between physical light, electromagnetic radiation, and the kind of enlightenment that you get spiritually. This idea of light and darkness is one of the key themes in The Lord of the Rings. Um, we see, for example, um, on the side of light, uh, light, reason, truth, goodness are all connected. The starlight that's enkindled by Elbereth uh, at the very beginning inspires the elves. The light of the two trees that's um, uh, created in, in that, that is, is embodied in the Silmarils, the Arendil star, in, in, in Galadriel's phial. Gandalf the white, right, uh, is an earthly manifestation of the sun, right, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, on the other hand, darkness is associated with evil and with non-being, right? We have Morgoth in the Silmarillion, the dark enemy, Sauron, the dark lord, Mordor, the dark land where the shadows lie, the dark fire of the Balrog, the intolerance of the orcs for sunlight. So rather than creating a large number of clever metaphors designed to, to elicit our admiration for his creativity, Tolkien weaves a tale in which a small number of true metaphors are endlessly repeated. Light, 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 darkness, darkness, darkness. And Tolkien actually believed that words themselves are literally a form of light. The word fantasy uh, is derived in Indo-European from the root word ba, which means to shine. So fantasy is a vehicle of light, something shines in, in, in fantasy. In his poem, Mythopoeia, Tolkien describes the work of the human mythmaker as one of splintering the divine light into many hues. In Indo-European, the very sound ba is also used for the word for speech. So shine, light, speech, these all come from the same world. And this is again, one of those ancient semantic unities that Barfield is talking about. Um, another really important thing about, about Tolkien's work is that he is literally trying to reconstruct for us the uh, prehistoric myths of, in his case, the Anglo-Saxons, the uh, ancestors of, of the English. Um, the uh, Oxford uh, linguist named Thomas Shippey, who took over Tolkien's chair in Oxford, uh, pointed out that just as historical linguists um, posit or hypothesize words that are no longer been recorded in, in lost languages like Indo-European, uh, and they, they call these words uh, asterisk words. They put little asterisks by them to show that we don't have any records of this word, but we believe that they once existed. So Tolkien reconstructs what, what Chippy calls asterisk objects, characters, landscapes, races, and stories, which we have little hints and bits and pieces of in the records, but that, but that Tolkien reconstructs for us. Um, so everything that we, we you know, all the key elements of Lord of the Rings, the, the orcs, the dwarves, the elves, both light and dark elves, the Silmarils, Ents, Wraiths, the Valar, Numenor, all of these things are drawn by Tolkien from actual prehistoric myths from medieval records of, of these things. Uh, the uh, Rorim, uh, Rowan, uh, is drawn heavily from Anglo-Saxon sources. So, um, uh, so Tolkien's uh, knowledge of these ancient mythologies is, is initially a very puzzling thing to do. Why does he spend so much time doing this kind of archaeological work to reconstruct actual ancient myths from the Dark Ages? And the reason, of course, is that following Barfield, he wants to recreate within us, as we read the works, the very sort of consciousness of the world that ancient people experienced. And he can only do this by, by reconstructing the actual myths and by using the actual words as much as he can from the languages, from these ancient languages. So, um, so of course, um, uh, as I said, live, light and darkness plays a crucial role. Uh, another crucial element here 
I know I'm running a little in time, slow in time, but I'll, I'll wrap this up soon, uh, are the, the role that elves play. So as Tolkien explains in, in On Fairy Stories, elvish enchantment is the archetype to which all fantasy aspires. So when, when the hobbits experience enchantment and they experience a kind of elevation of their consciousness in Rivendell and Lothlorien, we are transported with them. We experience a similar kind of elevation of our consciousness. By reading about the elvish enchantment, we are ourselves enchanted in much the same way. That's, that's the uh, thing that uh, Tolkien is, is, is pulling off. It's, I think, again, quite unique. You might recall that uh, when, when, Hot, when Sam and Frodo are in uh, Rivendell, they can't even remember how long they were there. They lose, they literally lose their sense of time. Sam thinks only three nights passed, when in fact it was a whole month. Uh, Sam describes his experience in Lothlorien later as one of living in a song. And when they leave Lothlorien, they, they struggle to remember exactly what happened there, which echoes another theme from Barfield, the challenge of bringing the insights we acquire through this primitive mode of consciousness to our everyday life. Um, so poetry is, is more philosophical than history, Aristotle once said. Uh, and what he meant by this is that poetry enables us to connect to these, these philosophical realities in a way that, that mere history can't by engaging us with these true metaphors, with these myths uh, that uh, connect us to the real world. Okay, that brings me to our, my final uh, thesis, which is that in order to understand the influence that Tolkien has had, we have to understand this philosophical and theological project that he's engaged in. What Tolkien, the reason that Tolkien's work is so attractive to us is that he is in, in, embedding us in this new world of this ancient mode of consciousness. And, and through doing that, he really transforms our way of thinking and liberates us from some of the prejudices of the modern world, the prejudices that modern science and cosmopolitanism and sophistication help to create. So reading Tolkien by itself won't uh, necessarily make you into a Christian or a Neoplatonist, but it does prepare the soil of the mind for the implanting of such ideas. Those who read and reread and love Tolkien will find the philosophical and theological works of C.S. Lewis and Farrer and others more plausible, but also the gospel, I believe, more plausible, more believable than they otherwise would. Now there's another important uh, facet of this, I think that often is under, underestimated. Fro Tolkien in his fiction actually anticipates and foreshadows many of the key movements and trends of the late 20th and, and early 21st centuries. The disillusionment with science and technology that's taken place compared to, again to the 1930s or 40s, the ecological or green movement, um, the rapid growth of traditional and more fundamentalist forms of, of biblical religion, the rise of fantasy as a major literary genre. And even I think the collapse of totalitarianism in 1945 and in 1989 to 93. So um, we have to, when we see these, this anticipation, there's really only three possible explanations. One is, this is just coincidence. I don't think there's too many of those for it to be a coincidence. Second one is prescience. He was actually able to predict that these things were gonna happen and he wrote about them in advance. Well, I think that's very unlikely. And there's no evidence, in fact, that Tolkien thought these things were likely to happen, or that he, he had any, any sense that, that these things were coming. And so the third explanation is one of causation, that Tolkien himself is actually part of the cause of these various trends. And there's actually some evidence for this. So uh, the environmental movement, for example, is large, uh, had, had a, was greatly influenced by Tolkien's work. There's actually an, a, a terrorist group called the Environmental Liberation Fund that uh, burned down a house in Bloomington, Indiana, and was inspired by Tolkien, who probably was called Elf, E-L-F, Elf. Um, go to uh, any Barnes and Noble, uh, or go to any bookstore, or go to Amazon, and almost any fantasy book that you find there is going to, sh going to uh, have influence of Tolkien in it somewhere. And, uh, and Tolkien, uh, Tolkien's views, uh, you know, when he, when he was writing, materialism, Marxism, logical positivism were the dominant views. Uh, they've all receded tr tremendously. And I think uh, Lord of the Rings has played an important role here. Tolkien's works have been in print continuously for nearly 60 years. The trilogy has sold well over 50 million copies. And uh, Christopher's son, 
Chris, uh, Tolkien's son Christopher, who just died recently, uh, produced a, a tremendous amount of work that also has been, been read. Um, on this last point, Tolkien's works were banned in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Europe before the fall of communism, but typewritten copies, Samizdat, uh, circulated widely uh, throughout that world. And of course, finally, we have Peter Jackson's films. And one of the things I find very remarkable about them is, is their faithfulness to Tolkien's vision. And this too requires an explanation because uh, Tol Jackson was not a Christian. I don't think he showed any sort of interest in, in Tolkien's philosophy or theology, but he is, at least to some extent, enchanted by Tolkien. And he's come under the spell of Tolkien. And that's why the films are as, as close as they are now, uh, close to the, to the works as, as in fact they, they turned out to be. All right, great. So I will uh, go ahead and uh, close it up at that point and um, turn to um, my other slide. So we've got some time, for, hopefully, for questions and um, uh, discussion. Uh, great. great. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Kunz. Uh, uh, really interesting. Uh, I, I have many questions. I will, I will start with one. So everybody who, if you have a question, just send, send the question to me and uh, I will answer to as many uh, as possible. So the first one is, um, uh, are there any similarities between uh, Tolkien and uh, Lovecraft in a cosmological slash God perspective? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, so in, in, in some respects, of course, Lovecraft is, is sort of the diametric opposite of Tolkien. Um, and, and at least at, at first glance, Lovecraft's world is a world in which uh, there are uh, certainly many superhuman, we might even call them spiritual forces out there, but they're mostly hostile to us and to uh, indifferent to us and uh, have no uh, orientation towards the good, I would say. They're, 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 either they're neutral or if they have some conception of good at all, it's completely alien from our own. Uh, and, uh, but like Tolkien, you know, we don't get that, we don't get a lot of lectures about that from, from Lovecraft. Uh, his viewpoint is incorporated into the story themselves, right? So, so I think methodologically, they're quite similar. Uh, there is, there has, I read a couple of, of Lovecraft stories. It's, it's some of, in that dream uh, series, uh, and I'm trying to remember the name of the character. Um, he may be the, someone who's listening will remember the name, but it's a character who, who's, who experiences uh, reality by, by uh, uh, traveling across the cosmos in dreams. And at one point, he does experience something that actually uh, is very Neoplatonic. That is, he discovers that the ultimate reality is a kind of single uh, intellect, right? That is, is pure and good. And, and so, you know, even in, even in uh, Lovecraft, where, you know, for the most part, it seems, the human beings are, are, are surrounded by an unspeakably horrible <laughs> reality. Even in, he, in, in some of his work, is sort of forced uh, to, uh, uh, toward a more Neoplatonic story about the ultimate reality, that ultimate reality has to be good. And you, you see, there's, there's, a, there's a reason for this, right? And it goes back to the Neoplatonism, that absolute evil doesn't really make any sense that whatever is ultimately real has to be ultimately good as well. And even, even Lovecraft ultimately has to accept that. Thank you, Dr. Kunz. Uh, do the races uh, of Tolkien's works uh, symbolize something? Why did he choose a hobby to carry the ring? Yes, right. So most of the races in, in Tolkien are drawn directly from this, this uh, mythology of the ancient uh, Germanic peoples. Um, so uh, uh, orcs, dwarves, elves, ents, um, all of these creatures are there in, in, in these ancient mythologies as, uh, as, as Tolkien was able to reconstruct them. The exception of the hobbits. The hobbits are completely a new invention of Tolkien's. Uh, they show up in this, in this book, The Hobbit, that he wrote uh, for, for his children. And um, so, um, so the, the hobbits are an interesting case. They really play two roles. On the one hand, and this is very clear in The Hobbit, actually, they are something like modern people who have been dropped in the middle of Middle Earth. They're a little bit like you and me, 
That is, they don't really care about great adventures, right? They don't have any grand uh, view of the world. They're just interested, they're very practical people, right? Uh, in the, you, know, you see this in, in The Hobbit and also in the beginning of The Lord of the Rings, they're very skeptical about dragons and wizards. I mean, what are these things, right? So they're, 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 they're sort of um, like us and they provide then an important kind of bridge for us as we read the books because we can identify more immediately with that part of the hobbits. And so it helps us, it helps us to make the transition into the Middle Earth. If you've ever read, tried to read the Silmarillion, um, Silmarillion has no hobbits at all, right? And you immediately miss them <laughs> because everything is so strange and everything is so exalted. You know, you have these great heroes or these really horrible villains and it's a little bit hard to relate to any of them. And the hobbits provide us with that kind of bridge. So that's one very important role they play. But as I think, as Tolkien wrote the works, and as, as the ideas develop, hobbits take on another role. And that is that hobbits are the sort of salt of the earth. That is, they are the humble, unpresuming, uh, uh, faithful, uh, Christians, right? They're, they're, they're sort of, they, I mean, they're not all of them perfectly Christian by any means, but there's something Christian about the whole ethos of hobbits, right? Precisely in their humility, precisely in the sense that they don't think of themselves as great. They think of themselves as little and insignificant. And, and of course, they end up playing this crucial role in The Lord of the Rings. They end up sort of saving the world, right? Uh, and, and of course, what, what that is communicating is this very Christian idea that God works through the weak. Right? The, the sort of thing that Paul, that Jesus and Paul both talk about quite a bit, that, that God chooses the humble, he chooses the weak, he chooses those that are of no, have no respect in the, in the world, simply in order that he may then show his strength and his glory through them. And, and you definitely see that in, 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 in the Lord of the Rings. So that's a great, great question. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, it comes from the ancient world. And, uh, you know, the, and the, the various, races play different sort of roles. I mean, the elves are very interesting because the elves don't die naturally. Uh, they can be killed, but in the absence of being killed, they go on forever. And it is not actually clear in the Lord of the Rings, but in Silmarillion, it's pretty clear that, that if you do kill an elf, the elf reincar is reincarnated in, in this world. So elves don't experience death the same way that human beings do. The elves are sort of tied to this world inextricably whereas human beings aren't. And that's a big theme in the Silmarillion and it's something of a theme in Lord of the Rings although it's a bit more subtle. Speaking about Silmarillion, I have a question for you. Are there any similarities between Ovid's uh, Metamorphosis and Silmarillion? Did Tolkien got inspired by Ovid's work? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know Ovid's work very well myself. Um, I'm inclined to think no. Um, so of course Tolkien, well, I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, obviously Tolkien had uh, a classical education in England. And so already in what we would call high school and secondary school, he was reading Greek and Latin, of course. So he knew, he knew uh, of its work in Latin in the original text. So undoubtedly there's some influence, right? Sort of unconscious influence there. But um, he was very much interested in creating a new mythology that reflected as accurately as he could make it the actual lost mythology of Anglo-Saxons. And so he wasn't interested in rewriting Greek um, or thought or Roman myths or, 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 or mythology. Um, he, he objected to the whole King of Arthur, King Arthur uh, mythology because he thought it was too corrupted by French sources. <laughs> so it had too much of a romance element there. It wasn't pure Anglo-Saxon. And so he was trying to avoid that, that kind of romance, Latin-esque influence as much as he could at the conscious level. But unconsciously, there probably was some influence, sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kunz. You, you talked, um, during your speech, you, you mentioned the, the light and darkness. And uh, yeah. is there a, a difference between his view on light and darkness and the modern uh, writers? Like, is the same way, uh, or what are the difference between uh, how um, uh, Tolkien uh, view evil and for, let's, say, let's take, for example, the Game of Thrones. Is there a difference between the evil and the good um, in this case? Mm 
Can you yeah. share more on that? I think so. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not an expert on Game of Thrones. I've read I've read some of it. Um, watched a little bit of the movies, um, but um, my sense is that uh, that Game of Thrones uh, reflects a much more I would say materialistic or naturalistic picture of evil, uh, namely that um, evil is a kind of um, well, the, 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 there's no deep difference between good and evil, ultimately, in the, in, in the uh, world of, uh, of Game of Thrones. I mean, obviously, you like the good people and you don't like the bad people, but, uh, you know, that it, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not a kind of metaphysical difference, right? Whereas for, for Tolkien, it is, right? For Tolkien, uh, those who are good, those who are in the light, are uh, more real, right? Um, and those who turn away from that to darkness and towards are, are turning towards non-being. There's this, they're, they're existing to it. They have a less and less, a more and more tenuous grip on reality. And you can see this again with the, with the um, ring wraiths. Uh, also, if you recall, uh, Bilbo talks about how he feels like he's getting thinner and sort of stretched the longer he uses the ring. So, um, so as he as he is tempted, at least, or as he kind of gets sucked into the realm of evil, he feels himself becoming less solid, right? Uh, as, as that progresses, and so you get you get that that idea repeated thousand times, right, in Tolkien's work in a consistent way. So there's a fully worked out, consistent philosophy of evil there, and I think um, in in Game of Thrones, it's just um, you know it's much less. Uh, sophisticated, frankly. Um, I mean, it's, it, I, you, can, you can look at it as interesting from a point of view of politics and economics and that sort of thing, but, but philosophically, pretty shallow, I think, compared to Tolkien. Um, speaking about um, evil um, and uh, a theme in Christianity, it's the after dying is the, is the, it's the theme of heaven and uh, and yeah. uh, um, hell. Um, yeah. So when you look at the works, uh, or works, works, um, is there kind of the, uh, do you think, I know he didn't have an agenda, but can we say that it's kind of the same thing that people might experience? Do you think uh, this was his uh, view on hell, for, for example? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Tolkien is trying to do something very different, let's say, from what C.S. Lewis does in, in the uh, Narnia Chronicles, let's say, where in the Narnia Chronicles, you get, um, especially if you read the whole thing, right? You get pretty much the whole of Christian theology. I mean, uh, Aslan is Christ, uh, you get the last judgment, you get eternal life in the, in the last uh, battle and so on. Um, Tolkien is trying not to do that, right? I think he thought that um, the gospel, the actual gospel of the Bible, right, is the true myth, capital T, capital M, right? It's, it's the ultimate myth, which, is, which encapsulates all truth. And so it would be almost impious for a Christian. Uh, he, didn't really, he didn't like the Narnia Chronicles because he thought it was sort of impious for a Christian to try to rewrite the gospel in a new form, in a fictional form. And so he wasn't trying to do that at all. He was trying to create a pre-Christian world. The closer analogy would be to the world of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, right? A world in which there's no Christ yet. There's not even a very clear statement of, of eternal life or a final judgment or anything like that. There are just hints of that, perhaps, but nothing very definite. Uh, but but, but in, which, in which the gospel story would be plausible Right, so that if you if you lived in Middle Earth, you sort of incorporate this Middle Earth way of thinking about things, and then you hear the gospel, you're going to think, oh yeah, right, that's uh, that's not surprising in a way, because I've already experienced in Middle Earth what what Tolkien called the EU catastrophe, EU catastrophe, that is the surprising happy ending, right, which you wouldn't have expected otherwise, right, and of course heaven is the ultimate EU catastrophe, the gospel, the resurrection, Easter Sunday. Right, that's that's a you catastrophe. That's the ultimate you catastrophe, to which all the happy endings in in the Lord of the Rings and in, in the Hobbit and so on are anticipating, are pointing to in various ways. 
And hell, likewise. I mean, uh, you don't have hell in, in the Lord of the Rings, but you have Mordor, right? Uh, you have Morgoth. You have, you have an anticipation of what hell might be like to some extent, right? Uh, and it's, it's, pretty nasty, it's pretty nasty, right? I mean, the orcs don't like each other. They don't get along. They hate each other. They have miserable lives. Uh, and, um, and, that's, um, and that's all pointing towards what, what hell ultimately would, would, would be like. So, so you do think the orcs are beyond redemption? Well, that's a good question. Um, certainly in terms of Middle Earth's world, they are. Um, there's, there are no resources in Middle Earth, I think, for, for converting an orc to, to, uh, to virtue. Now, whether, you know, again, if you bring the gospel into the picture now, right, so now Christ comes and the church is there and then you have the gospel, could, could that happen? Sure, I think. Um, I mean, Tolkien couldn't say no, I think. Um, but in the terms of the story that he's writing, they're beyond redemption, yes, beyond any sort of natural redemption, let's put it that way. Great. One more question on this uh, topic, and then we will. I have from all, all yeah, no, all all areas. Um, so you said about uh, about uh, the Lord of the Rings is like more like the New Testament, uh, Old Testament world, yeah. and uh, interesting. Maybe uh, also in the Old Testament, but also in the Lord of the Rings, we find prophecies. Uh, yes. So can you share more about that? You know what's uh, because uh, yeah. Um, well, there's been a lot of talk about this, right? About whether, you know, are there any Christ figures in the Lord of the Rings? And in a certain sense, yes, there are lots uh, in a way. So, um, so Frodo and Sam too, perhaps, are a kind of uh, uh, figure of Christ's passion. When Frodo climbs up Mount Doom and, uh, and ultimately you know, loses his finger and so on, that is a that sort of Frodo, suffering for the rest of the world and sort of paying for their sins so that they can be delivered from Sauron. And, uh, you know, Frodo's never in this life made whole. In fact, um, it's, it's sad, actually. I mean, it's not as though Frodo gets to go back to the shower and everything's fine. He's happy. He's not ever happy again. Uh, he's, he's sort of deeply wounded by the experience. And, uh, and so, you know, again, in the afterlife, we can hope, of course, Frodo will be redeemed and be totally happy, but, but in this life, he's, he's suffered for others. Uh, then you've got Gandalf, who's clearly Christ-like in many ways, uh, especially when he experiences a kind of quasi-resurrection. He goes from being Gandalf the Great to Gandalf the White after his great battle with, with Balrog, where he descends into hell, right, and then is raised up again as, as Gandalf the White. Um, I mean, you know, he's not literally Christ. Not, he's not like Aslan in the, Gar in the uh, Narnia Chronicles. And, you know, and it's, it's not literally a resurrection even, but it's, uh, it's certainly a foreshadowing and a and they kind of pointing towards towards uh, Christ, and then Aragorn, the the the, the man who uh, who wasn't a king, who's, who who grows up in these very humble, uh, you know, uh, beginnings. He's just a ranger out there in the wilderness, and yet in the end, he's crowned and he becomes the king. Uh, you know, very similar to Jesus born in Bethlehem and, and all of that. So there there are parallels there for sure. Uh, and, and kind of anticipations uh, in, in much the way that you might think of King David as a kind of Christ figure or Moses as a kind of Christ figure and so on, Joshua as a Christ figure source and so on. Uh, some things, th th things of that sort as opposed to, as opposed to um, I mean, there, there, are no, there are no concrete prophecies in Lord of the Rings, I don't think. I don't think there's anywhere where he actually says, you know, someday there will be a savior. You know, it doesn't say that. I, mean, I, th that. I think it, it says that, you know, the true, the true king, King will return to Gondor. It, it's a prophecy regarding that that the true. Yes. Or it was that expect they see that the true the, you know they they will know that the true king will will come to Gondor and reclaim the throne, kind of. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No. There are definitely there are definitely prophecies in in Lord of the Rings about about the return of Aragorn. He's, he's, he, that's definitely prophesied. Uh, you're right. Um, yeah. There's there's one there's a there's a dialogue that um, it's not actually in the Silmarillion. I don't think it's ever published except by uh, Christopher Tolkien later, where um, there's a dialogue between an elf and, an, and, a, and a woman, human woman. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, of the dialogue now. It's, it's slipping my mind. But uh, in that dialogue, they actually talk about whether 
there might be something like a savior that would come and uh, for, for human beings in particular, and maybe for elves as well. But, um, but because, because human beings, um, you know, we die, right? That's the crucial thing. And, 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 that, and, and for Tolkien, he wants to leave that in The Lord of the Rings is very much a mystery. How, how is it? How, what does that mean? What do we go after we die? Right? Uh, there, there are not really answers about that, except in this one little dialogue where they, they think, well, maybe there's some kind of future that, you know, that we'll, we'll enjoy and maybe the Savior will come and become human even and, and so on. But that's the only case where he kind of does that. Where he, where he produces a dialogue where, where, where they come close to, to discussing something like Christian theology. Uh, what do you think about the underlying motive of finality that's present not only in regard to the mortality of man, but it, but is also evoked multiple times in direct correlation to the journey itself, whether be it uh, be it the story slash myth or life itself? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, another thing that, that of course you do have in the uh, in the stories is this talk about the undying lands. Uh, the Tal Arasea. This is this is island, which um, used to be on the Earth, and is now in some other kind of realm that can only be reached by a kind of magic, right? Uh, and so, at the very end of the Lord of the Rings, uh, Frodo uh, and Gandalf uh, uh, leave on a ship that will take them to that undying land. And in fact, in fact, I think is this in Lord of the Rings or is this in some of the other? Later materials where it turns out that Sam too will join them and then go to those undying lands. So that's that's sort of an anticipation of heaven, but it's not really, because the undying lands are not literally heaven. They're a place where the elves live because they don't die, right? <laughs> they and and so uh, and so it's it's a kind of they'll have Fro presumably Frodo and Sam will have something like an elvish life there in these undying lands, but eventually that will end, right? Because the world will end. And, and then uh, they will die like, like any other human being will die. And so, um, so there is, um, so, so yeah, so, so you know, the, there is this kind of arc of the story that leads very naturally to the end, which is Frodo sails to the undying land, the end. Right? <laughs> it's a natural sort of culmination. But, you know, it's only an anticipation or a foreshadowing of the true end. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, the ultimate end, and I think I think there's there's hints of that in, in Tolkien. Uh, do you do you find the Sauron as boring, evil character, unilateral? Uh, yeah, flat uh, flat uh, arch enemy, arch enemy, arch enemy, uh, yes. arch enemy, right. arch enemy. Yeah, is Sauron modeled after uh, Lucifer? So two questions, three actually. Oh sure, definitely he is, and um, yeah, it's it's an interesting problem. Um, so, I think any Christian author faces this problem that in many cases evil seems more interesting than good, right? So it's actually very hard to write one of these stories and not have the evil characters turn out to be really interesting, the, bad, the good ones kind of boring. <laughs> uh, and you see this, for example, uh, I think the good example of this is Paradise Lost by, by Milton, John Milton. If you, you read this, but it's a great English poem about the gospel, basically, about the whole of Christian theology. And by far the most interesting character is Satan in the book, right? He's this kind of romantic hero. I mean, he's bad, but he's, he's interesting. Um, now, uh, in contrast to that, if you look at Dante, if you read uh, The Inferno, for example, when you finally get down to the pit of hell and you find the devil, he's just this slobbering, stupid, brutish creature, you know, chewing on uh, Judas Iscariot and so on, right? He's not interesting. He's pretty disgusting, right? Uh, and, um, and I think Tolkien thought Dante is right and Milton was wrong, right? You don't want to make the bad characters more interesting, right? There's something wrong with you if you do that. You haven't grasped the reality properly. And so Sauron is supposed to be, yeah, not very interesting because there, there's not much there, really, just a kind of naked will for power, right? Uh, and he's not particularly bright, really. He's just ruthless and grinding and, and all of that, right? Now, Saruman is more complex, obviously, right? But he, there too, I think Saruman becomes less interesting as time passes. He's more interesting in the beginning than he is at the end. And, that's, and then Tolkien wants that, because the more Saruman sinks into evil, 
the less there is of him, and therefore the less to be interested in. So it's 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 a it's a feature, not a bug, I guess, right? To put it as computer scientists put it, uh, that is, it's very deliberate on Tolkien's part. The Sauron is not an extremely interesting character, right? He's not like the not like a Lex Luthor from Superman comics or something like that. He's he's, he's supposed to be uh, threatening, horrible, but not too very interesting. Um, Dr. Kunz, when, when we look at the, uh, the ring in itself and his power, is there yeah. a par pa parallel between uh, the, uh, the ring and his power and, I don't know, scene or something else we see? Uh, how do you look? Uh, parallel what between it be, and, and what? Uh, the parallel between uh, uh, the ring and his uh -huh. power and sin, is that a correct? Sin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or what would be a good parallel, the power of evil and the degradation it's uh, doing to the carriers or? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I wouldn't, wouldn't say that, it's, that the ring represents sin, exactly. It rather represents um, what happens when sin is unpunished and unpunishable. So it represents the sort of uh, allowing sin to run rampant, right? Because that's just the key thing. If you have the ring, you can become invisible. And, you know, you see this with Gollum. I mean, he can just steal and do whatever he wants. And he doesn't have to suffer any consequences. So he's able to um, uh, give full, as long as he has the ring, he can just do whatever he wants, right? And so, and so, so it, it's, it, I guess you could put it this way. It's a sort of a sin magnifier, right? If you have any sin to begin with, uh, the ring will magnify that sin because it will give you the freedom, the, li the license to, to exercise that sin without, without limits, without any kind of consequences. Right? And uh, so it represents that. It also, I think, represents um, power over others. Right? Uh, naked, unrestrained power over others. And that is addictive, right? Uh, because we're sinful. And so again, the more you use the ring, the more you have to use it, the more irresistible it becomes. It's addictive, literally addictive. It's like heroin or some other drug. Um, and here I think it's of course very true, right? I mean, I think uh, history shows that the more power someone has, political power, uh, could, could be social power, economic power, power within the literary circle, doesn't matter what, the more power you have, the more you want and the more you have to exercise that power. And that, and that is, you guys say, that, that, that results in a kind of magnification of sin. Oh, I just want to, uh, just a couple of more questions and then we yeah. will uh, close the meeting. Um, do we have anyone today, today anyone like Tolkien, a poet to, to teach us uh, about reality in that sense? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm probably a bad person to ask. I, I would think we probably won't have another person like Tolkien for a thousand years, right? <laughs> I mean, I think he's right up there with Homer, Virgil, Dante. I mean, he's, uh, he's one for the ages. So that, that's setting the bar awfully high. Um, and, uh, you know, it's difficult, I have to say. Uh, Wait, if we, yeah, go ahead. If, if we lower the, the bar... Yeah, it's hard for me. I mean, I find myself, I find it really hard for me to read other authors in, in, fic, in fantasy now because I keep comparing them to Tolkien. I think it's just not as good as Tolkien, right? Uh, so I know I need, I need to get past that because it's really, that makes things really hard for anyone to, uh, to build on his work. Um, yeah, um, well, I mean, I, I personally like Lewis's work more than Tolkien did, um, especially the, the three science fiction books, the Paralandra series, like that quite a bit. Um, but let's see, more recent authors, um, gosh, um, I mean, I, there's some, I, I think someone like um, uh, Neil, uh, uh, let's see, it's Stevenson, is it, who's written a bunch of uh, science fiction recently, is quite good, I think. I mean, it doesn't have the same, theological perspective that Tolkien does, but as, as a technical, at a technical level and as, and as an imaginative author, he's quite, quite good. Uh, he, he wrote the, the book of the, um, the um, Diamond Age by Stevenson. I, I like quite a bit. 
Dr. Kunz, one question and then we are going. What, what is your, uh, do you have a favorite scene or I don't know, mm -hmm. when you look at the book, is there yeah. something that many that's just your heart, it gives you hope. I don't know. What, what's yes. your favorite scene? Okay, wow. Okay, let me see. I think that the scene that I think about the most is when Sam and Frodo are in Lothlorien and they're looking in the mirror of Galadriel. Um, and I, I just find that fascinating because it, it, from a philosophical point of view, it raises all kinds of interesting questions about, about I don't know, past and future uh, prophecy, time travel, <laughs> all those kinds of, of puzzles come, come into play there. And, and at the same time, I mean, it hits, it's a lot of the, of the major themes of the book uh, appear there as well when, when Galadriel is tempted you know, to become the dark queen of the world, right? And then turns it down. That's a crucial, crucial point in the, in the whole story. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kunz. Uh, thank you for uh, what, if, what everything you shared. It was an honor to have you Great. tonight with us and uh, we will want to uh, have you on again as a again. speaker. Um, uh, if you have just one more thought uh, before we leave, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, I just, I do hope that uh, what I've said will encourage people to read Tolkien again. I mean, I read him every year or two, um, all the little things and uh, like I, you know, the Silmarillion is not is an acquired taste, but I think it's worth acquiring. It's it's, it's a fascinating book.